You know, I've been continuing to meditate, um, and welcome, by the way. Uh, my name is Mark. You're wondering who I am. I'm the senior pastor here. I have the privilege of serving together with my wife. And if you're online, can I just say welcome to you? And if you're catching up uh, this week, it's great to have you with us. Um, we, a few weeks ago, launched our Presence and Power series. Can I just say, what a blessing having Fred preach last week. Um, Fred and Elizabeth, our... Verso Luton site pastors, yeah, we, we launched Verso Luton in September. and Just such a powerful word about restoring the presence and power of God in our lives. And the way Fred unpacked for us the truth that when we are outside of the right, the wrong, when we're outside of the right environment, we malfunction. And what an amazing explanation of saying that's what happened when we, when we were cast out of the Garden of Eden, outside of God's presence, we started to malfunction. Just like if you take a laptop, was a, one of Fred's examples, it's fine in this environment, but if you put it in a sink full of water, it will malfunction. And uh, just so blessed for that talk, thank you for sharing your heart with us. If you missed that, you can, can catch up on our YouTube channel and make sure you hit that subscribe button and that bell notification to get important updates through the week. So I launched this by talking about Ephesians 1. Anybody been, you don't have to put your hands up, but anyone been, uh, you know, just soaking and bathing in Ephesians 1. I would recommend it. And the thing about Ephesians 1 is it says that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And that because we are seated in heavenly places, the power that raised Christ from the dead, and you have to imagine that's a lot of power, and brought him to the right hand of the Father, is the same power that's in you and me in Christ Jesus. And that word power is dunamis, a Greek word dunamis, and, the, and that's where we get our English word dynamite from. And I have been meditating on this word and saying, I don't think that I fully walk in the truth of my position in Christ. Because if I truly walked in that truth and I grasped that truth and believed in that truth, my life would look a lot different. And so I have had, I've been uncomfortable as I've meditated on that word, not because I've been uncomfortable with the truth, but I have been uncomfortable with the disconnect between his truth and what I'm seeing. And you know what that's got me doing? Passionately seeking and saying, Lord, I want this in my life. Like when the word of God provokes your heart, he does so in order that there would be a response for, from us to seek him and a reality of that truth in our lives. Um, I want to tell you a bit of a story for, in terms of what the Lord's been doing uh, with me this week, which is a, an introduction to the topic that I'm going to be speaking on this morning. You know, last Sunday, blessed by Fred's talk, and as I continue to meditate on Ephesians 1, um, as a family, we had um, dinner and um, we were clearing up, and I just felt led of the Lord to put a praise song in the kitchen that we were in, very, very loud, much to the, to the, to the smiles and laughter of my children. And then even more so, I started dancing around. Um, and the song was Spirit Break Out. You know that song? Spirit break out, break our walls down. You know that bit? Spirit break out. And I was singing it loudly. Break our walls down. And then it's come Jesus. And I was going for it. And I would just felt this mm, stirring in my And I'd love to tell you I do this every day. I, I, I don't. But I just felt like I'm going to start declaring God's truth over my children. So as I'm Spirit, break out, put my hand on Lucy's head. And I just declare over you the blessing of the Lord. And, and, da, da, da. and then I did it over Daniel. And I just declare the blessing. Spirit, break out, break our walls down. And Ellie, I just pray. And, and then I started dancing. And then I grabbed Lucy and I swung her around. And Steph was dancing. And before you know it, we were all dancing, singing, Spirit, break out, break our walls down. Da, 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 da. Mm. I was like, I want to walk in the truth of the fact that I am seated in heavenly places. There was this authority that rose up in me. And so this whole week, I have been proclaiming the truth of God. And then Tuesday, we had space. Who was here for space? Uh, that's our monthly prayer, worship, 
uh, prophetic art, flag waving, uh, night, an hour and a half. And um, as I was leading, the Lord gave me this picture that I shared with everyone. And it was uh, this huge lamp, light. You know um, the light they used to uh, let Batman know they need him? You know the one? Go straight into the heavens kind of thing. I saw this. It didn't have the Batman sign on it. It was just like this. And I felt the Lord say, Mark, you need to stand on that light because you've got a light right to heaven and you need to proclaim that light, that truth right now. And the Lord said, I don't want to hear any more. Could you, would you, should you? I want to hear from you. I declare in the name of Jesus, his truth. What is that light? It is his truth, his word. Mm, why? Because we're seated in heavenly places. I mean, it's either true or not true. I rather happen to believe the Bible is true. Do I get a witness in the room? And so we are called to stand on the truth of his word and proclaim it. And I said, right, this is the, well, the picture the Lord had shared with me. I want you to come and declare. And then later that evening, we were saying goodbye and I was talking to Fred and I said, Fred, blah, 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 and we talked. And then I went to say, well, bless you as we went to say goodbye. And instead of saying bless you, I said, bless me. I was like, oh. And then the Spirit stopped me and said, no, I want him to bless you. I said, no, Fred, you know what? Bless me, please. And he laid hands on me and he blessed me in the name of Jesus. He declared over me, he blessed me. And I'm like, there is this thing, there is this, mm, I either believe this and declare it or I don't. Yesterday, um, Steph and I and the kids went to, um, we live near Flamstead, Flamstead Arts Festival. And in the afternoon, we were having a drink and I was, we were just chatting as a family. And um, I said, hey kids, I wanna, do you remember when I was doing that singing and stuff last Sunday? I, I said, every day, you know what, I've been pr praying over you and declaring God's truth over you. And, um, and uh, one of my children said, yeah, you know what, Daddy, I have seen a bit of a difference this week. And uh, I said, well, I'm gonna continue to do that. In fact, tonight I'm gonna pray a blessing over your pillows as you lie down. I'm in a declaring kind of mood. Because if you believe the word of God, then you're gonna declare it. And I'm looking at my life thinking, if, imagine if those that said yes to Jesus lived their lives like his Bible was the truth. Like that's, imagine if I live my life like I believe that word was 100% his truth. Like wouldn't my life look different? And so I've been stirred this week about the power of our words. You know, it says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Like what you say out of your mouth has an impact into the environment around you. And it says in Luke 6, 45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Some of us, there is a massive disconnect between the confession and the profession of our faith and what we are bathing our heart in and what comes out of our mouth. And so this morning, what I want to do um, is I want to talk about the power of proclamation. And as I thought about this, I, reminded, I was reminded that I had a book on my bookshelf by Derek Prince. Now, Derek Prince... Uh, was a wonderful Bible teacher. He passed away in 2003 at the age of 88. He had a global ministry. And um, some of you older people will probably remember Derek Prince's VHS tapes. Um, and um, he had the book called Prayers and Proclamation. Now, I have three of them here. Who would like one of these? Right, you have one. Come and get it. You have one. Sister, you have one. Bless you, and you too. There you go, sister. Mm, that's passion right there. Sister, I've got another one for you. You can have my personal copy. And, uh, and I want to credit this talk with, with what I read in Derek Prince. So I'm not copying him. I'm, I'm saying that his teaching in that book is so good, I'm going to use it. So thank you. I can't say thank you. Derek Prince is not here, but anyway. <laughs> that's my heart. Now, let's look at this then. Proclaim 
is a strong word. It comes from the Latin word that means to shout forth. A related word in the New Testament to proclaim is confess. Now, confess means to say the same as. That's what confession means, to say the same as. For us as believers, that means us saying the same thing with our mouths, listen, as God has already said in his word. Confession is saying with our mouths the same thing that God has already said in his word. That is confession when we confess. And so the power of proclamation is that when the words of our mouths agree with the word of God, we position ourselves to receive the full backing of authority of Jesus. That is the power of confession. When we align ourselves and our mouths declare and proclaim the truth of God's word, we position ourselves to receive the full backing of heaven. Now, let's carry on this thread because in Hebrews 3.1, the writer to the Hebrews says that Jesus is the a high priest of, now, oftentimes we just say he's a high priest, which he is, but listen, he is the high priest of our confession. He is our high priest of our confession, which means this, we have our part to play in the role of Jesus as our high priest. Go with me on this. He is the high priest of what? Our confession. What happens if you don't have a confession? Have you ever thought about this? He, he's a high priest of our confession. The partnership is this. You confess, you align yourself with the word of God and Jesus says, I will release my authority as I intercede for you and as I am your high priest. So what if there's no confession? Well, he's saying, well, I'm waiting for you to confess. Hmm, do you see the power of this? And it's worth saying we do the opposite. You see, you either confess his truth and align yourself with the high priest or you confess the enemy's lies and you align yourself with that activity. That is why there is power of life and death in the tongue. What are you confessing? His truth or the lies of the enemy? Oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, they don't like me. I've got nothing going for me. I can't believe that person. Like, what is coming out of your mouth? Is that your confession? Because if that's your confession, you're aligning yourself with the father of lies. Are we aware what comes out of our mouth? We are called to confess, to proclaim his truth. And so a proclamation is a confession that is made by force. It is a word which speaks of warfare. It is releasing the authority of Jesus into a situation. That is what proclamation is. Into your environment, over your life, over your family's life, over your friend's life and the lives of others. And so if we continue to unpack the dynamics of proclamation, proclamation is the real, is really the activity of what we call a herald, okay? So proclamation is a confession and it is the role of the herald to therefore proclaim. Now, herald is an old word. We don't really talk about a herald much, but in the uh, medieval times, the herald was a person with authority from a king or ruler or other such nobleman. And the herald would go from place to place, and what would he do? Make a proclamation of the will and the decision of the ruler of that kingdom. And he would say, oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. Ring a bell, oh, yay, oh, yay. And then he would go on to do what? Make a proclamation of the king with the authority of the king that's backing him. Right? That is, so you and I are called to be heralds. And then what would happen as he's, oh, yay, oh, yay. You're like, well, we better stand to attention because there's about to be a proclamation of truth from the king. That's what happens in the spiritual realm when you say, oh, yay, oh, yay. I've come to proclaim the truth of Christ. Stand up. He's about to release the authority of God into this situation. Now, I would like to use a story in the Bible as a picture of what this looks like that Derek Prince shared in his great teaching on this. I reserve the right to do a part two next week, given the time, so uh, let's see how we go. <laughs> I would like us to look at the story of Moses when God called him in Exodus 4, uh, verses 1 to 5. It's going to be on the screen in the room. If you're online, it'll be on your device. It says this, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. 
Uh, if you're, uh, this is the moment where uh, God has appeared to Moses in that burning bush. And the Lord said to him, verse two, what is in that in your hand? And he said, well, it's a staff, it's a rod. Pretty ordinary. And he said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. I, I'll probably do the same. Oh, it's a snake. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. I mean, I'm no snake expert, but I suspect that's not a smart thing to do. But God said it and Moses, bless him, was obedient. So he put out his hand and caught it. And what happened? It became a staff in his hand again. Now, what a story. The seemingly ordinary staff, that ordinary rod became an instrument of something, of what? Divine authority, why? Because he would take that staff and he would extend it out and things happened. What happened when he did the staff? He defeated the magicians of Egypt. When he extended and stretched out his rod, he stripped Pharaoh of his power. This seemingly ordinary rod. What about when they got to the Red Sea? What did he do? He extended his rod and what happened? The water parted. And the list goes on. He stroke, strike, st struck, that's the word, a rock. And what happened with that ordinary rod? Water came out. Why? Because when he extended that out, he extended out the authority of the king in that moment. Now, what if I told you you have a rod in your hand too? Here it is. This is your rod. It looks like an ordinary book. But when you stretch it forth, something happens. This extraordinary book held by an extraordinary person in Christ Jesus. You see, just as Moses used that rod as divine authority in a situation, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, God has given you a rod to use. The question is, are you using your rod? And so with this book, the Word of God, we can use to extend God's authority into any situation, the spiritual battle we are in, as we seek to bring God's kingdom there, as we proclaim and confess the truth of His Word, because as we do that, something happens in the atmosphere, in the environment, in the spiritual realm. And we might look at this and think, well, that's an ordinary book. Let me tell you, this is a supernatural book. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God, and yet... How many times is it just on the shelf gathering dust? In a moment, we're going to look practically at how we can extend out our rod. But I want to just talk about another dynamic of this because we first need to understand a key truth about his word, okay? His word, the Bible, as I said, is a supernatural book. Just like the rod of Moses, this book contains power, which isn't obvious. Now, let's look at Psalm 33, verse 6. It says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and the breath of his mouth, all their host. By the word of the Lord and the breath of his mouth. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach, which is also the word that we use when we talk about the Spirit of God, the breath of God. And so what we see here is that there are two agents, if you like, involved in the creation event. One is the Word of God, which as we know is Christ, and that is the Spirit of God that activates that Word. We know in the creation story, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, getting ready. God by His sovereign, God the Father by His sovereign counsel of His sovereign will, decreed and decided that there would be, He spoke as the Word was spoken, that was the Word of God, Jesus, and then the Spirit animated that. And so, how do we actually speak? Well, it is the breath in us that enables the word to come out of our lips. You take the breath away, you can't speak. Your words have no power. And so this is how God speaks his word. It is by his word and by the spirit. And so, I'd like us to read uh, 2 Peter 3, 5 and 7. I believe it's gonna be on the screen. Are you with me, by the way? Good. Bless you, brother. Let's look at this. 2 Peter 3, 5, and 7, it says this. It 
For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the... And that by means of these, the world and then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same... By the same... The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now... What we need to understand about the word is this. The word of, by the word of God, the heavens were created. By the word of God, his creation is maintained. And by the word of God and his timing, he will abolish them. Your words have power in that same way. To proclaim the truth to create in his name. To sustain his presence, to sustain his blessings and his truth in a situation and to abolish things in his name that are not of him. I quoted before this talk, Isaiah 55, 10 to 11, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, purpose and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. My word will go forth, God is saying, by my spirit and will do that which I have accomplished it to do. And you see, when we proclaim his word in spirit, the two need to come together, then things happen in his name. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, as just we follow this thread, that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Right, follow me with where I go with this. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. In other words, the word itself, without the spirit of God breathed on it, does not bring life. In fact, it brings death. Maybe you've been in a situation where someone has quoted scripture to you out of whatever spirit it might be, anger or bitterness, and it's hit you in such a way that hasn't brought life to you, but has brought death. Why? Because God wasn't breathing on that letter. How is it that you may have been in a sermon, I pray God not in this place, that you have sat there and someone has read the scripture and it just hasn't hit? No spirit of God. Word and the Spirit need to be together. So, Mark, how do we proclaim the Word with His Spirit? I'm glad you asked me. First, we need to proclaim it to ourselves. We need to do so with confidence and boldness. We need to stand with a position of this is God's truth and this is His Word. And you know, for some of us, we have to start at that point. We need to relook at how we look at the Bible. We've looked at it maybe of a historical account, which it is. But maybe we've just studied it for theological pursuit, which is nothing wrong with that. But if you just stay in those two places, you're not going to be able to allow the word to do its thing in your heart. We have to make up our mind that we believe it. Ask yourself now, I'll say, Mark, do I believe this word? Ask yourself that question. Do I, be, do I actually believe this word or do I think some of it I believe? Because if you, if you come from a position of some of it, you need to go back into the word and say, Lord, is this, is this all your truth? And he'll say, listen, if you open your heart to receive from the Lord, he will reveal his truth to you. It says in Romans 10, 13, Paul said, Paul said to the church in Rome, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. So first you need to make a decision that this is God's truth. Next, you need to submerge yourself in the word. If you want to proclaim with the spirit of God and with the boldness and courage of a herald, then you need to get this word in you and in your heart because out of the overflow of a heart, the man speaks. If you want to proclaim and you've got none of this in your heart, then you're going to struggle. I found my personal testimony this week is, I thought, well, as I proclaim this over my family, they're going to change. Well, I've seen some change, but most of the change has been in me, which I've needed more than any of the others. Because as I let this word bring faith into my heart 
as I have aligned myself with his truth, something happens and happens in your heart. And from that place, you proclaim it in the Spirit of God with faith and boldness. So don't just think, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna proclaim, I'll pick a couple of verses, proclaim it, and then I'll pick it up next Sunday. That's not the lifestyle of a herald. What happens with a herald is that they would live in the court of the king. And then the king, right, I want you now, you've been with me, you've seen me, we've had conversation. I want you to go out now and herald and proclaim that which I've given you. We need to come out of that place of relationship and soaking in his word to then proclaim the truth of God. Are you with me, brother and sister? If you're looking for a quick fix, you're in the wrong place. If you're looking for a magic formula, you're in the wrong place. Because it all comes out of his presence. The power comes from his presence and walking in the truth of our identity in Christ that we are seated with him in heavenly places. We are talking here about aligning ourselves with God's truth. Now, before I give an example of how we do this, you might at this stage be thinking, well, hold on a minute, Mark. This sounds a lot like trying to, quote, manifest things by believing in something and saying it. This sounds a lot like the law of attraction, you know, the secret. I want to say it's not. This is different. Now, the enemy is a counterfeit, right? The enemy cannot create anything new. He just corrupts what exists. So he said, you know what? That proclamation, declaration thing is a powerful, God-given thing. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a counterfeit called law of attraction and manifest. Uh, and I want to do that so that Christians think, well, we better not proclaim because isn't it like that? You see the tactic of the enemy? It's like the prosperity gospel. God wants to bless you, but because of the prosperity gospel, which is a false gospel, it's his name and claim, we don't even want to come and, and, and declare his blessings because like, well, I'm not part of the prosperity gospel. The enemy's like, ha ha, I got you. And the thing about a counterfeit, listen, <laughs> a counterfeit is evidence that there is an original. There ain't no need for a counterfeit if the original ain't there. That's bad English, but you hear my heart. <laughs> a counterfeit demonstrates that original exists. And so I'm not talking about the counterfeits of law of attraction and manifest. I'm not saying, I want to manifest a yacht right now. Mm. That's of the enemy. I want to attract all the good vibes of the universe. That's of the enemy. We're talking about proclaiming his word, not yours. We're proclaiming his truth, not my truth. Hmm? Well, don't go manifesting your own truth. There's another dynamic that I want to unpack before I give an example. I'm, I'm pushing the example out. I know the time. I take the liberty of, of Jesus in this moment and extend slightly over. You know, let's go back to the story of Moses. What happened when it turned into a snake? He was fearful, right? He trembled, as one would. And I want to talk about the importance of trembling at his word. Like, we can't skip this. We talked about proclaiming that we make a decision that his word is truth. We talk about his word in our heart. We talk about believing on his word, and we're going to declare it in a moment. But you also need to hold this word trembling. Isaiah 66, 1 to 2 says this. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. Do you want God to look at you? Do you want his favour upon you? Do you want his grace poured upon you? Do you want his countenance towards you? Right, then he who is humble and contrite in spirit and listen and trembles at my word. 
Do we tremble at his word? Do we understand this is the word? Because by the way, if you read his word and you understand it and you don't follow his word, his word will judge you. When you come to the beamer seat of Christ where he hands out rewards to the believers, this is a different judgment that is for non-believers. We're already judged to say we're saved. But every word that you speak, whether good or bad, God will judge. Hmm. Listen, I want us, I want me, by the way, I'm going to talk to myself. You can listen in if you wish. Mark, you need to have trembling of this word. I mean, look, it's powerful. Do I pick up my Bible and tremble at its power? Do I tremble at the reality of who God is? He's not some cosmic Father Christmas that I call upon when I need something. He's not some Santa Claus that rides in one particular night when I think I feel good about that and I want him to come down my chimney. This is the holy word of God. And do we hold it thus so? Okay, let's do some examples. We're gonna take his word. So how do we proclaim? Well, we get scripture. And what I like to do is soak in it first. Let it breathe and say, Lord, would you just get this word in my heart and then personalize it for yourself. So here we go. What happens, there's two types of proclamation, defensive and offensive. There are times when you feel under attack and you need to be defensive and stand on the word. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And there are times when you need to go on the offensive and maybe we'll look at the offensive next week as we attack. Right, what about when you feel like you have no future and no hope? What do you do in that decision? As a man thinketh, so is he. So what do you just say? Yeah, you know what? God doesn't love me. I've got no hope. It's, it's, I've got fear in my heart. Or do you say, I'm going to do some proclamation right now. I'm going to get Jeremiah 29, 11, which says this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Do you believe that? Right, then I say this. I declare that God's word says that he has a plan for me. I declare that right now over my life. I declare that God has plans for welfare for me and not for evil. I declare and stand on His truth that His plans are to give me a future and a hope. And I proclaim that now to the principalities and powers and I declare the truth of God's Word. That's what it means to proclaim His truth. And listen, you might need to do that over and over. If you, if you are of a pessimistic disposition, and you had a lifestyle of thinking negatively, you're gonna to have to keep doing that, brother and sister. It says in the Bible, seek and you will find. Seek his word, declare it. What else? What if you feel under attack? Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. That's you will condemn it. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord here. Hands up if you're a servant of the Lord in this house. You've got a heritage right now. What is your heritage? You're a co-heir with Christ. What is your heritage? You're seated in heavenly places. Are you gonna walk in it? And their righteousness is from me. The righteousness that you have is from Christ. And so I say this, I declare in the name of Jesus that no weapon formed against me and my wife and my children shall prosper. I stand on the truth of God's Word and I say every tongue which rises against me in judgment, I will condemn in the name of Jesus as a co-heir with Christ and as seated in heavenly places. And I declare right now to the principalities and powers that this is my heritage as a servant of the Lord of which I raise my hand and say yes. And my righteousness I declare is not from the Lord, but it is from Christ. That's proclamation right there. What else? What about when we feel condemned by the enemy? You know, oh, you're such a sinner. What's the point? Give up now, you might as well. I mean, you sin Monday, you sin Tuesday. Wednesday, not bad day, but Thursday, you sin really badly. Friday was terrible. Saturday, well, let's talk, talk about Saturday. And here you are on Sunday thinking you're a Christian. That's a lie of the enemy. You'd say this, Romans 8, 1 to 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who does not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. And so I say this, I declare right now to you, the lies of the enemy, that there is now no condemnation to me. You have no right, you have no authority to condemn me because I am in Christ Jesus seated in heavenly places. And I will, walk, I will not walk according to the flesh, but I declare that I will walk according to the Spirit of God that is in me. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I declare that over my life. I declare that over my wife, my children. I declare that over my family. I wanna tell you, brother and sister, if you're seated in heavenly places, then you've got a job to do to herald His truth. Did you know that you can affect your atmosphere? Did you know that you can affect your lives by the words that come out of your mouth? Are you speaking death over yourself? Stop it in Jesus' name. Don't confess lies because you align yourself with the enemy. Are you gonna confess with your lips the truth of God so the high priest can say, great, that's time to confess. I'm gonna intercede for them right now. Oh, Lord Jesus. Mm. If, you wanna, if you need a breakthrough, brother and sister, you need to start proclaiming. I need to proclaim in my life. I haven't stopped proclaiming. I wake up in the morning when my wife's still asleep and I lay my hand on her and I start proclaiming over her. I'm not some holy guy. I'm not something special. I just can't move away from the fact that if God says I'm seated in heavenly places, then I want to see a reality of that. I am just a normal guy that is comprehend, that is got by the Word of God that says the power in me is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I mean, I don't want to read that and not live it. I think us Christians, we've, we've had this powerful supernatural book on the side and we've just been like, that's the Bible. I'll read it now and again but it's a weapon. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Church, let us stand as I end this service.